Well, everyone, please welcome me in joining Mr. Pat Mills to the stage. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'll ask a few starter questions, get things rolling, and then uh, please just raise your hand and stand up if you guys have any questions for Pat here. Um, so yeah, just to kick things off, uh, how did you come to star in this? Film. Uh, are you an actor yourself? Uh, I was a former child actor, um, but I was in the movie by accident, kind of. So we did a bunch of auditions to find David Gold um, as a character, and we just no one was really nailing it. And then my producer saw me doing some improv when we were auditioning some of the teenage actors. And they're like, Pat, I think that you need to audition for your movie, which was, if you can imagine, really awkward. <laughs> so I had to um, audition for my producers to be in a movie that I wrote and was going to direct, which is a lot like getting your parents to watch you masturbate when you were a teenager. <laughs> um, so that was awkward, but then I ended up landing the part, and then I ended up doing it. So it was... Uh, it ended up being the right decision, but for the per we were just talking the first four days, I was like, I've made the worst decision of my life. I want to die. So <laughs> like, I didn't have anyone to tell me I was doing an okay job. So I got really insecure for the first four or five days of the shoot. And then I talked to my producer and said, you need to tell me I'm doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got such great performances out of the younger cast members. Can you talk a bit about uh, casting those roles and working with them? Were they very experienced when they came aboard the project? Um, some were. The girl who plays Rhonda, the shy one who drinks, was in the Skins show on the MTV. But a lot of them were didn't have a lot of experience because they were all young and they didn't want to get like 25-year-olds playing 15-year-olds. So a lot of it was improvised. So we did a lot of improv in the guidance office just to like go off script and keep it authentic. So that really helped, and because I've been on the other side as a child actor where you're kind of terrified, you're with all these crew members who are like intimidating, so I wanted to create an environment where everyone could, you know, there's a safety net and everyone can just be themselves and not be self-conscious. So that is a huge part of making a movie, just make everybody feel cool. <laughs> uh, does anyone have any questions at this point? Just raise your hand if you do. Uh, yeah, we'll start uh, here and then we'll go to you, ma'am. So. the budget? Huh? First question. Uh, so our uh, the te the budget was two hundred and seventy five thousand, but our real cash budget was like a hundred and sixty, hundred and fifty. So not a lot of money to do it, but we had a good team that made it look a lot more expensive than it is. Well, maybe maybe it looked like shit. <laughs> <laughs> that looks good. And uh, you right there have a good question. Um, I was just curious about the the character that you wrote for the gym teacher. Was this based on anybody, the gym teacher? Well, um, the, the gym teacher is sort of based on a lot of experiences that I've had with like really confident gay men who um, want to get you out of your comfort zone. <laughs> and I've always been kind of shy. I lost my virginity at 28. Like I didn't, wasn't like one of those like confident gay guys. So I've had a lot of experiences with people who are a bit forceful and then I'm really naive. So. There have been experiences where I'm taking a cab with somebody at the end of the night, or like they're driving me home, and then all of a sudden they like make out with me, and I'm like totally thrown. So I kind of based that character based on these guys that I've had to deal with being a repressed homosexual. <laughs> uh, does anyone else have any questions at this time? Um, so, oh yeah, you right there, sir. How much? Uh, how much was the improv? Ooh, that's a good question. Probably about 30 per, 20 to 30 percent. Whenever we would shoot something, um, especially in the guidance office, we did about three takes of script, two or three, depending on the time we had, two or three takes of scripted, and then I would always save time to do one, like, let's totally fuck with it. And sometimes we'd fuck with it two times. So a lot of the stuff with Jabrielle, in the guidance office was scripted or unscripted. A lot of the stuff with uh, the go all the goth girl, I was like, "Oh, you're fun." Let's <laughs> after lunch. Let's can we? And I talked to her, can we like organize another thirty minutes with her? And so all of that stuff with, you know, t talking and her giving me a, the makeover. All of that was like just thought on the day. 
So I, it was good in the um, guidance office scenes because it was pretty contained. We had one set that we were able to, we didn't have to move around a lot, so we were able to have more time to shoot stuff. So it was good. It was helped the movie. We have time for one more from the crowd if anyone else has a question. Uh, yeah, right over there. Where was the apartment building in Toronto? The apartment building belonged to our uh, PA. <laughs> this is how you make a movie with no money. <laughs> can, we use, can we hire you for no money and can you actually shoot your apartment? <laughs> um, so that's around St. Clair and Young. It's on Young Street. Um, do you know the Yeah, name? I just saw the girl in the corner. So okay. Like, is that it? Yeah. yeah. It's a cool old like vintage 60s, 50s apartment building. Yeah. And the exterior is actually the interior as well, which doesn't happen all the time. So. Um, yeah, and things. Uh, could you talk a bit about when uh, the film's going to be released and what you're working on next? Yes, the film is, I think it's coming out. So we have a, we were amazed. It's amazing that we got a Canadian and a US distributor for the film. And I think they're going to be releasing at the same time at the end of July. And the last time I stalked this movie on the internet is July 24th. So it'll be coming out definitely in five cities in the US. And we are going to open in Toronto, but probably expand. So hopefully it'll come back here. And if you like it, tell everybody. Um, and uh, what are you working on next? Oh, yeah. I have been writing a teen dance movie set in a retirement home um, <laughs> for about six years now, and we basically did guidance to prove to the funding agencies that we can do something with not a lot of money, so um, it's done quite well, so I hope we're going to be able to get the financing together. We we're hoping to shoot that in August, and it's called Don't Talk to Irene, and I won a screenplay competition in Austin for it, and we're just hoping to get like a famous person in it, which will be weird, and I'm not gonna be in that movie, so that'll be a lot easier to shoot. <laughs> Great, well I'd like to thank Pat uh, for joining us again today. That was nice to thank you, for coming. And uh, if you enjoyed the film, please Facebook, tweet, Instagram, uh, I don't know, but Vine? Vine? I don't know. Can you Vine about this? Or Reddit? I don't, yeah, know. I don't understand so, Reddit. Use those social medias to, to tell your friends how sweet this movie is. And uh, we'll see you at the rest of the festival. Thank you. Well, for me, it was me. It wasn't. Uh, it was more of a character thing rather than a plot thing, and I wanted it to be something that's like repressing everything. So I didn't want it to necessarily become a cancer movie. And I had this mold that I always like that was built on mine. So I've always been keeping an eye on it. So it was just another thing to like create this alter ego out of myself, and it was just a reflection of that. Because I've always been like paranoid if I get this kind of cancer. Oh, what I would I do? <laughs> My mom had it. I, I, but yeah. So. Um, I was wondering about the kind of comical take you took on mental illness and what that actually means, or I guess so in most movies, either usually when people learn from the mentally ill person, it's like in Revolutionary Road, like in the novel, like, oh, the crazy person that shows us our lives are right. BS, but what does it kind of mean in a more comical sense of where you're supposed to laugh at him, but then also take something from him, even though he's killing himself and possibly other people. Right. Well, I kind of feel like everything should be approached with a sense of humor, right? So I was kind of approaching this character who was like, has a shitload of problems, and if you are suffering from anything, if you if you can laugh at it, it's just going to, you're going to be able to deal with it. And he's sort of based on, I have a lot of like insecurities, so I kind of created this character based on myself, and in doing so, kind of it's a bit of a self acceptance, like jumping back and forth, but like exploring that. I allow, like making fun of myself completely allows me to be like, okay, this is how I am. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I'm a psychologist and a professor, so oh, in okay. class, the <laughs> self deprecation and the making fun definitely helps things. Yeah. And then usually therapy is. Probably a little too serious most of the time. So I thought it was kind of an interesting for sure, for sure. Uh, take on it. It kind of reminded me of uh, there's a short film 
drunk adults or it's on device. Uh, I will. There's no way to actually get to contact you, but there's no, a movie uh, with. Um, he's my card. Okay. Yeah, he's on the uh, HBO show about that technology. Yeah, this is a uh, terrible reference. But it was probably the only other like uh, comedic take on kind of alcoholism that then has a semi somber tone, but it doesn't turn into melodrama. And I right. thought these are the only two things that I've ever kind of seen that really have balance into that take on things. Well, I kind of feel like if you have a substance abuse problem, everybody takes it so seriously. And I think that you create a problem out of that that is not your actual problem. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that if you can, okay, let's take it for what it is and deal with that rather than creating this big, I kind of feel like people create a neediness and a drama out of their problems where all they need to do is deal with their problem. And I, we're all like, we don't have control over our lives Yes. in a lot of every single way that when you have control over something, if you can take control of your substance abuse problem, and it becomes bigger than it actually is. So there's actually a great short story by David Foster Wallace called The Depressed Person. <laughs> yes, it's fantastic. And it's, uh, it's everything about the depressed person supposed to do a lot of depressed person needs to do this. And it's like, sure. it's like fighting oh, Yes, and the character Amazing. doesn't even have a name. Her name is The Depressed Person. And it's that exact thing. <laughs> Into them this whole like I'm going to call people at 4 a.m. and they, they never could leave because I'm going to depress you like exactly. And I'm going to create another situation where I'm going to get attention. Where yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just I don't mean that. No. So thank you. Cool. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's my favorite. I'm, I lean over at my boyfriend. I'm like, the concert that was so much in each other. That's awesome. It was perfect. Cool. Well, I've heard you. that from another teacher. Yes. Really like, really, the tones of the staff, the non teacher, that very, very. Awesome. Can I tweet you? Because I should like to tweet you. It's better with the flash. It's always there. Is the flash on? Yeah. Now, do you have a. Yes. Do you have a. Oh, it's a good thing to do. You have a wow this setting. Do you want me to hashtag it? Uh, you can. It's good.